What up African world, it's Home Team here, and I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And welcome back to my series, A Closer Look. And today, we're going to be taking a closer look at the Tuareg people. And as always, if you want to support the Home Team, you can do so on Patreon.com. I have some new rewards for you guys, so be sure to check that out. Also, go to Afrographics.com, a website where you can find unique illustrative infographics summarizing African history. All links to Patreon and Afrographics and Home Team merchandise are in the description box below. The Turig are Berber-speaking people who live in southern Algeria, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and the far southwest of Libya. The name Turig, or more correctly, Tuareg, is in Arabic plural and is the name others call them. The Torah called themselves Kel Tamashek, meaning speakers of Tamashek, or Kel Tagumast, or veiled people, for the large turban or Tagumast worn by the men. Tamashek is one of the dialects of Berber, which belongs to the Afroasiatic group of languages. The Tuareg or Toreg are estimated to number between 1.5 million and 2 million according to government agencies though the Tuareg themselves give numbers closer to 3 million. The Tuareg have their own legends of how they've come to live where they are today. The legends unanimously say that the Tuaregs came from the north, some from southeastern Morocco and others from Libya. The Tuaregs of southern Algeria recount that their first ancestor was a woman of noble birth from southeastern Morocco, whose name was Tin Hanan. She was also the ancestor of the Tatok Turegs, who lived northwest of Hogar. She came riding on a white camel, accompanied by her maid, Takama. The Kel Gala tribe, the leading tribe of the Hogar Turegs, as well as the Tatok tribe, who are the leaders of the Anat Turegs, are descended from these two women. According to legends, their grave is a ruin near Abalasa. This ruin is a kind of stone fortress measuring 80 by 75 feet, which contains a number of burial chambers. In one of the chambers, French archaeologists did indeed find skeletons of two women. Often called the blue people because of the color that the indigo dye of their clothing leaves on their skin, the Tuareg are a semi-nomadic people. They're known to Greek and Roman scholars as the veiled Sanhaja. The Tuareg claim descent from the Berbers of North Africa and are believed to have migrated southward during Arab invasions of North Africa in the 7th century. These migrants eventually developed several political confederations called Kells, all of them affected by caste hierarchies and clan memberships. Some Torah confederations, particularly the Kel Away and Kel Gress, migrated into the savanna zones of the Sahel. Many people often wonder why they see such vast diversity amongst the Torah people as it pertains to their physical characteristics. This can be explained due to Tuareg history. Beginning around the 11th century, to assure an agricultural labor supply while the Tuareg nobles traveled on long-distance trade journeys, these confederations conducted raids on communities to the south, acquiring slaves, serfs, and tribute states, which made payments in crops such as millet. By the 15th century, Tuareg society recognized numerous categories of status and caste. These included the Iklan, or slaves, the Erewelin, the descendants of the Iklan, or slaves, and the Imrad, the tribute-paying clients, as well as the Tuareg nobles, who had a tendency to be of a lighter complexion in general. They called themselves the Emigerin, which is Arabic for the proud and free. Most Iklan, or slaves, once captured, were traded to another federation to reduce the chances of escape. The slaves were then assimilated into Tuareg society and culture, cultivating palms, vegetables, and grains on their owner's land, and sometimes accompanying trade caravans. Although subordinate to the nobles, the Iklan, or slaves, were generally considered part of the family and both loyalty, cooperation, and marriage offered opportunities for social mobility. In fact, the founder of one of the most prominent cities in the medieval world, Timbuktu, was by an Iklan woman. The woman's name was Buktu, 
and Tin means well, hence the well of Buktu or Timbuktu. Torah confederations had established control over several important trans-Saharan trade routes. Despite the varying levels of power that the Torah possessed, they could never seem to have total dominion over the region as the empires of the Solnenka, Mandinka, and Songhai became the preeminent power in the region. In many cases, some Torah clans being loyal to the Manza of Mali. Later, in the face of increasing internal pressure from the Hausa, Fulani, and the Sokota Caliphate, Torah nobles attempted to forge a more centralized kingdom. The leaders of several Kells established a sultanate based in Agadez, a city in present-day Niger. Although the Torah were then able to dominate much of the southern Sahara, they never established the kind of enduring centralized authority structure that were forged by neighboring groups such as the Kanuri Banu and the Hausa. This was in part due to their preference for nomadic rather than sedentary living, a preference that later put the Torah in direct opposition to both colonial and post-colonial governments. Beginning in 1900, the colonial governments of French West Africa began a relentless campaign to relocate the Torah and other nomads into agricultural villages. They also imposed taxes on the Trans-Saharan trade caravans and confiscated camels from the Torah to use for their own desert military campaigns. Also, the prohibition of slavery deprived many Torah communities of vital sources of labor and food. The resulting economic decline, coupled with a series of devastating droughts in the 1910s, rallied the Torah into rebellion. Throughout the next 12 years, the French and Torah attempted to undermine each other by filling in wells, destroying crops, and stealing animals and supplies from sedentary farmers, actions that ultimately destroyed much of Torah farmland. By 1922, many Torah groups sought refuge in non-French colonies, such as Nigeria and Libya, though most returned home after the French West African colonies became independent in the early 1960s. In recent years, the Torah have been involved in a series of conflicts with the national governments. Beginning in the 1970s, Niger and Mali both started mining for uranium in territory that had traditionally been claimed by the Torah. Displaced and suffering from ongoing drought, the Torah groups began attacking towns for supplies. In Mali, these attacks were met with violent military repression. Many groups attempted to flee the area, but were turned back from Niger and forced to settle in refugee camps until the drought subsided. In the early 90s, the Torah in Niger rebelled after the government failed to fund promised Torah relocation projects. Conflict spread across the Sahel and Mali as Torah separatist groups demanded the creation of an all Torah Saharan Republic. Unfortunately for the Torah, it became increasingly difficult to imagine how their nomadic lifestyle would continue to thrive and exist. Despite this, the Torah have a very ancient history and have been the masters of the Sahara since ancient times. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help out in its continued production, you can do so on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.